good morning. Glad to see everybody this morning. Just thank you guys for being here and welcome. Uh, just uh, a beautiful day that the Lord has given us to be here. And of course, if you're a guest, as always, we welcome you and uh, we always want to get to know you a little bit better. We do have connect cards that are out in the foyer or over in our welcome center and you can fill those out and just take them to the welcome center after the service. And they have a gift for you there. And so we just thank you guys for being here and also welcoming all those that are watching at home. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this morning and uh, the verse I want to share with this morning is from uh, Psalms it's Psalms 8 1 and it says O Lord our Lord how excellent is your name in all the earth who has set your you above the heavens your glory be known and it's just important to remember how much God's glory should be seen every day in our lives and I'm uh, just thankful that we have that ability to see it this morning as we're here together let's go to the Lord in prayer Lord, thank you for today and just thank you for the opportunity to come before you, Lord, and to hear your word this morning, to be in your house, Lord, to fellowship together and to learn what you would have us to do. Uh, guide us through this service to uh, have open hearts uh, and to be focused, Lord, on your will for our lives this week. And we pray all these things in your precious son's name. Amen. Good morning. Glad to see everybody out. Let us stand and we'll start the service. Good morning. 
Good to see you here this wonderful Lord's Day and what a beautiful day it is. And we've come to worship someone we have to shout about. Well, there's much to shout about the Lord Jesus, isn't there? Because he is so wonderful and so phenomenal just in who he is. And, and, and then add alone to what he is. Uh, I'm not singing. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, they want me to sing, but I'm not going to torture you that way this morning. So, uh, but, but we have much to sing about when it comes to Jesus. I just do my singing privately. How about that? So, but we are glad you're here for worship this morning. And we've come to worship King Jesus. And we are so excited just to be here today. Uh, as we spend a few moments in prayer together, I just want to share with you some praises and some prayer requests. I don't know if you take notice this morning, but we have reached over $700,000 in what you have given to the building fund. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. As of the April loan statement, the balance on the loan is $324,875. And so that loan balance is coming down. So we praise the Lord for that. Thank you for your faithfulness and continuing to give and uh, give above and beyond. And so we're thankful that every month we're giving above and beyond our payment, that you're giving above and beyond our, our payment that we can give towards the principal and get that loan balance down. So we just praise the Lord for that. But thank you for uh, your generosity and continuing to give towards the building fund. I also want to thank you for praying for Tanya Full. Or Tanya uh, had her thyroid taken out this week, and praise the Lord, the surgery did go well. As we told you last Sunday, they were going to do a, uh, you know, some testing afterwards, and they did find a little bit of cancer in one of the nodules, but praise the Lord, that was well contained. It didn't spread anywhere else. And so right now, they're just going to keep an eye on Tanya. She'll follow up with the doctor in several weeks to see if she needs to do anything, but right now, it's appearing that she doesn't need to do anything. So we praise the Lord for that. Uh, Tanya is home. She spent a couple nights in the hospital because they're trying to get her levels right after that surgery surgery, but uh, she's doing well, but do continue to pray for Tanya as she recovers. And then if you would pray for Kim Pearson's aunt, Pat, Patsy Duke, you may have seen the email that went out this week. She fell this week. She was rushed to the hospital and they found out that she has a brain aneurysm. She went into emergency surgery. Uh, the surgery did go well and uh, she's in the hospital recovering. She'll be up there for probably about another week and a half, but do continue to pray for Kim's aunt, Patsy Duke, if you would. And then pray for Christy Murray and her family because Christy's sister, Joy McFadden, passed away back on the 16th. And uh, Joy, I think Christy told me, she, she said Joy was 98 years old. Uh, Christy's the youngest and Joy was the oldest, but she lived a long, good life and she's with Jesus. So we praise the Lord for that. But also on the 12th, Christy's niece, Susan Moore, passed away as well. And so we want to pray for Christy and her, and her family and just remember them in our prayers. And then if you would pray for Karen Hall, we mentioned last Sunday about her uncle, Joe Jacobson. Uh, he was on life support and uh, the family was going to have to make a decision where the Lord made the decision. The Lord took him home last Sunday afternoon. So he's a whole lot better off. He's healed. He's in heaven. And so we're so thankful for, for that. But we do want to pray for Karen and her family as they'll be missing her Uncle Joe. And then, as uh, you probably know, we have a group of ladies that are in Gatlinburg, Tennessee for the Women of Joy Conference. And so they're having a good weekend there. We've got 15 ladies there. Uh, God's been doing a work in their lives through the guest speakers and uh, just, just speaking from God's Word. But they had a great time of worship last night. They had a concert with Matthew West, and it was a great time of worship from what I understand. But they'll be heading home this afternoon. They wrap up around noontime today, and they'll be driving back. So do pray for those ladies as they're worshiping this morning and studying God's Word together. But then as they drive home from Gatlinburg. Remember them in your prayers if you would. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful and thankful just to gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we give you praise and glory for who you are, Jesus, but also for what you've done. Father, it seems like uh, last Sunday, Easter came and went so quickly. And, but it, even though Easter it was last Sunday, we still continue to celebrate what Easter means. It means the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about and the change that brings to our life. So here on this Sunday, we come and celebrate you, Jesus, and your death, burial, and resurrection as well. And we give you praise for the impact that your death and resurrection have had upon our lives and continue to have upon our lives. And we give you praise. So as we worship together, may we truly think about who you are. As Cameron talked about, that we share your glory with this world and show your glory to this world of who you are. But also maybe we worship you because you alone are worthy of glory. You alone are worthy of worship. And so I pray you be honored and glorified in this time. Father, we thank you for what you have done in our midst and continue to do in our midst. And the generosity of your people to give to the building fund that we've now surpassed another milestone of, of over $700,000 has been given. We give you praise for that. And the loan amount is coming down. It's down under $325,000. We give you praise, Father, that the loan is coming down so quickly. And we just uh, pray you continue to, to bring that amount down. And thank you for the generosity of your people and just continue to stir them to give, Father. But, Father, we're thankful for the facilities you have blessed us with and how this 
those facilities are being used for your glory and will continue to be used in the future uh, to bring honor and glory to you and to impact this community with the gospel. Father, we thank you for being with Tanya Fuller and her family with her surgery this week. We thank you the surgery did go well. And, and even though we desire that no cancer be found in that thyroid, you already knew that little bit of cancer was there. But we're, we praise you, Father, that your hand was upon her because that cancer is, was well contained. It didn't spread anywhere else. And we give you praise. And Father, as it appears now that there's nothing they need to do uh, because of that cancer, we just pray it stays that way. And we just pray for her healing as she's at home recovering. And Father, I know she desires to be here today and she may be here for the later service, but but we just pray you strengthen and heal her body, Father. And we just pray when she goes back to the doctor in several weeks that she gets a good report and, and uh, there's no need to do anything else, Father, other than heal. And we just give you praise. Father, we thank you for being with uh, Kim Pearson's aunt, Patsy Duke, this week. And she had that fall and they discovered that brain aneurysm and went into emergency surgery and, and as she's in the hospital recovering now we thank you that the surgery did go well we just pray you put your healing hand upon her as she recovers lord and just uh, be able to bring her home at the right time in about a week and a half father father we pray for these families that have had loved ones pass on lord we pray for christy murray and, and her family in the passing of her sister and her niece and karen and her family the passing of her uncle lord you being the god of all comfort that you would pour your comfort upon these precious families in the days to come and we thank you that these loved ones are in heaven with you and they're healed and they're a whole lot a whole lot better off but we know they're missed and so we pray you minister to them and use us to minister to these families in the days to come and lord we pray you be with our ladies who are in gatlinburg tennessee right now and they're gathered with thousands of women to worship you and to study your word together this morning we thank you for impact their lives friday night and yesterday and the time of worship they had through through song yesterday lord uh, with the concert of, with matthew west and we give you praise and we just pray you continue to do a work in their lives and make them more Christ-like. And as they travel home this afternoon, Lord, uh, keep them safe and bring them home safely to us. And Father, as we continue in worship, may you be honored and glorified as we seek to glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Wanda. Aren't you thankful? We don't have to live the Christian life on our own. That Jesus is there. The whole, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have Almighty God to help us. And sometimes we think we can do it on our own, but the reality is, is we can't. Take your Bibles and turn to, with me to Colossians chapter 3. And actually, we're kind of talking about that same theme this morning of how we need God to help us do certain things in our life as we talk about this passage of Scripture this morning. We're picking back up in the book of Colossians. We took a couple Sundays off with Easter and Palm Sunday and picking back up where we left off in Colossians, beginning in verse 5 this morning. Over 45 years ago, the first edition of a book came out, and the title of that book was called Dress for Success. And it was very popular, it sold very well, and in fact, it, you know, it's still available today, just in an updated version. But the premise of that book was that um, what you wear has an impact on whether you would be successful or not. And that book was written towards the, the, the target uh, audience was the business world. And it was talking about, it was, it was released in 1975 and, and talking about that, that, you know, you dressed in such a way in the business world and you were perceived as being successful and it helped make you successful. There's also an organization that's still out there today called Dress for Success. And this organization, it provides suits for, for ladies as they go for interviews. And, and they provide career development skills to help these ladies get jobs. And, and tens of thousands of women each year benefit from this organization, this nonprofit organization helping low-income women. And they help them transition into the workforce and help them find jobs. And each, each client that comes into that facility, and as a matter of fact, there's one down in Raleigh. Uh, they, they receive a, a brand new outfit, a brand new suit or, or pantsuit or skirt suit or something to help them with their interview. And then once they get the job, they receive a brand new outfit, another outfit to help them as they wear, wear that outfit to work each and every day. And so they want to help them be successful. But in our text today, Paul tells us from a Christian point of view, from a spiritual point of view, how we can dress for success as a Christian. You see, he uses the idea of, of how we dress to emphasize how we're to live our Christian lives. In light of what God has done for us and what Jesus Christ has done for us and how he calls us to live, it's the idea of, of putting on clothing, if you will, spiritual clothing, and taking off certain clothing, spiritual clothing, to help us live a successful Christian life. And, and let me just define what successful is. Successful is not man's definition of success. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about God's definition of success. I don't know about you, but one day when I stand before Jesus, I want to hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And unless we live that way here on this earth, we will never hear those words one day when we stand before Jesus. And so this morning we're talking about dressing for success, not to go to work, but to live the Christian life. So stand with me in honor, if you, in honor of God's holy word if you're physically able. And let's look and see what Paul wrote here in Colossians chapter 3, beginning there in verse 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to, here it is, put off. All these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on, there it is again, the idea of putting on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image, uh, excuse me, yeah, according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, there's that phrase again, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Father, we pray this morning as we look into your word once again, Holy Spirit, that you will speak to our lives about living a successful Christian life. And this idea of dressing for success, Lord, may we realize there are certain things we need to put off, that we need to take off and get rid of out of our life. But there's also things we need to put on and add to our lives. And we can't do it on our own. We need to do it what we wanted to sing about. We do it with your help, Almighty God. So, Lord, challenge us to look at our lives this morning and see if this is the life that we're living. A life that brings honor and glory to you. And, Lord, if not, then convict us through your spirit, through your word. And Father, just open our eyes and our minds to be receptive and our hearts to be receptive to your word that we'll be changed by it this morning to be more successful in your eyes as we live the Christian life, Lord. 
And I ask of you, Holy Spirit, that you empower me to preach your word this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' life-changing name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, if you're going to be successful living the Christian life, then there's things that we have to take off. The idea of taking off clothing, but there's also things that we have to put on. And we need to learn how to clothe, our, clothe ourselves in certain ways and certain behaviors and certain attitudes and, and, and certain things in our life to be successful in God's eyes. So that one day, when we stand before King Jesus, he will look at our life and he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I mean, think about it this way. You know, let's just say you, you like to exercise and you have certain clothes that you wear for exercise. And I mean, obviously, if I go to the gym, I'm not going to wear my suit to the gym. If I do, I need to go see the doctor because something's wrong with my mind. But, you know, if I'm going to go exercise, I have certain clothes that I exercise in. And if I get invited, this isn't going to happen. But if I get invited to the Oval Office, I'm not going to wear my exercise clothes to the Oval Office. It's just not appropriate. It's, it's not the style that we should be wearing. You know, it, you know, the, 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 you know it's just not appropriate. And so think about it this way, the, the, the old patterns of, of our old sinful life, the old attitudes of our past sinful life, they're not appropriate for our life anymore. We should be having different patterns. We should be having different behaviors. We should be having different attitudes and desires in our life as we live our life with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, they're not just a, 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 out of style, if you will. They're dangerous if we live our life according to the old way of life. You know, some valuable instruction is needed here. That's what Paul gives us. And he gives us here in our text some things that are needed, some things that are essential. If we're going to live our life in such a way that we're successful in God's eyes. So there's two ideas I want to share with you as we think about dressings for success in God's eyes. And the first idea is this, off with the old. Very simple, off with the old. To begin this section of discussion, the Apostle Paul uses some strong language and he challenges us to the idea of, of putting away our sinful nature, of putting away the corruption of our old sinful nature. Look at again what he says in verse 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. In other words, Paul is literally still saying to us, kill it. That's what we're to do. We're, we're to kill our sinful nature. We're to put to death our sinful nature. And this isn't an option. People say, well, what if I don't feel like doing it? This isn't an option. This is a command from God that this is how we're supposed to treat our old sinful nature. Now remember, when you repented of your sins and you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Savior of your life, to be the Lord of your life, you died to your old way of living. You died to your old sinful nature. If you go back and read verse 3, it talks about us dying. That's what it's talking about. Dying to those old sinful ways. Listen to what Puritan Richard Baxter wrote about this idea. He says, use sin as it will use you. Spare it not, for it will not spare you. It is your murderer and the murderer of your world. Use it, therefore, as a murderer should be used. He says, kill it before it kills you. And though it brings you to the grave, it will not be able to keep you there. You know, once we're exhorted to put our, our old sinful nature to death, to kill that sinful nature, Paul moves on. He reminds us of some of those past behaviors that we did as lost people, that we did before we knew Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He goes on to say in verse 5, he says, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. These types of sins characterize mankind in his sinful nature, mankind in his depraved nature. You know, people, people say, well, you know, um, that's just not their fault. That's just the way they're raised. No. We are born with that sinful nature. Man, man or woman, a boy or girl is not a sinner because he sins. We sin because we are born as a sinner. Therefore, such behavior can only be expected from someone who's a sinner. You know, sometimes it always amazes me. We have someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, and they're doing certain things. And people who do know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, they look at that person and say, they shouldn't be doing those things. Shame on them. They shouldn't be doing those things. That's all they know to do. Because that's the only nature they have. It's a sinful nature. But when you get saved, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and you receive that new nature, as you saw on the screen, those chains of sin are broken in our life. The bondage is broken. Therefore, we have a new nature so we can do something different. You know, these types of sinful behavior that we used to do with our old sinful nature are listed out there for us. He, he kind of lists kind of the sins of immorality at first. Look what he says. He talks about fornication. He talks about uncleanness. Now, that word fornication comes from the word which we get our English word pornography from. I mean, let's just be honest. Sexual immorality is running rampant in a society in which we live. 
Whether you turn on the internet, whether you, you're just, instant, just checking your email and an ad pops up, or you're just doing something, or you're watching TV and a commercial comes up, it's everywhere. I mean, this, this is the idea. It's running rampant through our society. And, and this, this word for fornication, that where we get our word pornography from, it's, it's, it talks about the whole spectrum of sexual immorality. It talks about sexual relationships as, as fornication and adultery and homosexuality and even incest. It covers it all. He says, we shouldn't be doing these things anymore. But you know what the sad reality is? And I'm just going to get blood here because we need to address this topic. Is that too many Christians are letting this type of sin rule and control their life. Too many Christians are, are being controlled by, by these type of sexual sins. The sad reality is, is that many Christians are still addicted to this type of lifestyle. They're addicted to pornography. Paul reminds us that we died to this way of life at the point of salvation. We don't have to give in to this temptation and be addicted to these things anymore. But the problem is what we do is, is it's like we just kind of bring back to life our old sinful nature and we go down that pathway again and we let those sins control us. Let me, let me just give you some proof so, so I'm not, you think I'm just making this up. Studies have been done to show the effect of pornography on the church today. According to Baptist News, a Baptist News article back in January of 2021... So it's not that old. It's a little bit over a year old. 70% of Christian youth pastors report that they have had at least one teen come to them for help in dealing with pornography in the last 12 months. That's 70% of our youth pastors in Christian churches today say they've had at least one teen come to them. I bet you they've had more than one teen come to them. Listen to this. This is really starting to, you know, it's very eye-opening, but it's also very sad. 68% of church-going men and more, listen, more than 50% of pastors view pornography on a regular basis. Only 13% of self-identified Christian women say they have never watched pornography. What's that mean? 87% of Christian women have watched pornography. Of young Christians, adults ages 18 to 24 years old, 76% actively search for pornography. 57% of pastors say porn addiction is the most damaging issue in their congregation. And 69% say porn has adversely impacted the church. Friend, sexual morality has got a clutch on the lives of Christians. And it's not letting go. But through Jesus, friend, we can have victory. And we do have victory. He purchased that victory on the cross of Christ. But the problem is we begin behaving by our old sinful nature again. You know, this is something that, that Paul says we need to put off. We need to be done away with. And I realize an addiction is, is not easy, easily done away with. It's hard. But help is available. And you can't do it on your own. You say, how do you know? I have counseled people. But I've seen victory in their lives. God brings the victory. Help is available. This addiction can be overcome with God's help and in God's way. Friend, let me, just, let me just put this out there, and, I, and, and I'm not calling you out. I'm just putting this out there. If you're struggling with this sin, you don't have to be in bondage anymore. Help is available, and we can help you. Let's move on. He kind of lists sins of impurity now. Passion, evil desire. These words might be rendered as unnatural affection along with evil desire. It speaks of moral indecency, filth, and, with, and lust. And that just feeds into what we just talked about with fornication and pornography. Let me just ask you this morning, what is it that you most desire in life? Friend, if we desire the this, this sinful passions and these unnatural affections, these evil desires, they've got a hold on us once again. That's what we're desiring. Friend, it's time to put them off. To get rid of those things in our life and let God help you do this. The Holy Spirit can change your desires. The Holy Spirit can change the way you think. See, our minds are geared to think a certain way. Our, our minds are affected by our sinful nature. And so what do our minds go to? They go to sinful thoughts at times. Unless you do what Paul says in Romans 12, you renew your mind. Now, come on, you know the answer to this. How do you renew your mind? Say it out loud. The Word. That's why, and I, I'm going to beat this horse until I go to heaven. We need to be in the Word every day. Every single day. Because your mind and my mind is always under attack by the enemy. We need to guard our minds. We need to renew our minds. I've got a friend in the medical field. He does biblical counseling. And he's got all these degrees and has all this knowledge. And he was explaining to me how the mind works. Over time, we teach our mind to think a certain way. 
It's kind of like walking through a field. If you take the same path through that field, what are you going to do? You're going to wear that path down. And that's what we've done with our sinful nature. We've taught our, we've taught our mind to think this way. But friend, with our new nature, we need to wear a new path. And we do that by being in God's word. We have victory by being in God's word and renewing our mind. And then he mentions covetousness there. And he takes time to list this as a sin of idolatry. Now that word covetousness comes from two words. One word is desire. The other word is to have more. Boy, is that not our society today, isn't it? You put that word together, it's the desire to have more. That's what covetousness is. Why is covetousness characterized as idolatry? You see, idolatry is not, sometimes when people think of idolatry as, oh, they have this, this, this carved image out of stone or this carved image out of wood and they just bow down and worship. That's idolatry. Yes, that's a form of it, but that's not all idolatry is. Idolatry is so much more. Understand this, at the basic level, idolatry occurs when a person gives their deepest loyalty to some sort of force, some sort of power, some person, some, some entity or something other than God. So covetousness is idolatry because it gives the person's supreme allegiance to the possessions of their life. To the things they want. To the things they have. Rather than the one who gives life and is life, the almighty God. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, Jesus said this. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. There's more to life than things. But look at how we live our lives. You know, growing up, we had toys. As adults, we have toys. They're just bigger and more expensive, aren't they? I mean, you, you see all the things that we desire to possess and all the things that we desire to have. And, and, what, and what did a lot of those things do? Now, look, I know it's warming up outside and, and we're, let's just hit on it. Got a boat. That means I got to be at the lake every Sunday and Saturday. I've got a house at the beach. I've got a house at the mountain. I've got a house at the lake. That means I've got, I've got to get my money's worth. So I've got to be there every weekend. So I'm going to miss church between now and next November. But that's all right, though. God understands. Those possessions become our idols if we're not careful. And God gets pushed to the back burner. We need to be careful, friend. You see, when a person desires goods more than they desire God, that's covetousness. The sin of idolatry. No one can, no one will, and no one is able to serve two masters. Jesus made that clear. Our ultimate allegiance will only be devoted to that which is our, our heart's desire. So what do we desire this morning the most? Whenever something or someone consumes a person's passion to the point that it becomes the driving force in their life. Then it is a matter that has taken the place of God. And therefore, it's a sin of idolatry. Friend, what do you desire most today? Is it God or is it something else? Now, once these graphic lists of sins are given, Paul reminds us this in verses 6 and 7. Because these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So what is Paul saying there? The people who have not repented of their sins, the people who have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ, one day, because of their sins, will face the wrath of God. We already know that, don't we? I mean, that's just what the Bible tells, tells us. There's a punishment for our sins. But you don't have to if you will place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then Paul tells us that these sins... They used to dominate us. They used to captivate us. But notice what he says... Which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Friend, if you know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, you've repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in him to save you. You don't have to live that way anymore. This is how we used to live. This is how we used to walk. As Christians, these sins should not characterize our lives anymore. Jesus purchased our victory on the cross of Calvary, friend. And remember, you live in victory because of what Jesus has done. The problem is sometimes we forget we already have victory. We just need to live in that victory that Jesus has purchased for us. That's how we used to live. We're not forced to live that way anymore. The chain of sin has been broken. The bondage of sin has been broken in our lives. Look at verses 8 and 9. But now you yourselves are to put off all these. He lists some more here. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Notice that twice we're instructed here to put off these things. 
These are sins that, that have, to have no place in our lives. They're to be removed from our lives. Now, what type of shameful behavior is to be removed from, from our lives? We list them out there. He talks about some, some sins that we might classify as inward hostility, anger, wrath, malice. That word anger describes a deep internal feeling. It, it reflects, get this, a smoldering attitude of ill will towards another person. It just sits there and smolders. You, have you ever been mad at somebody and you're just sitting there smoldering? That's what he's talking about here. Remember what Jesus equated anger to in Matthew 5? He equated it to murder. Because of the thoughts there. The Bible does not condemn all types of anger. We know that. Ephesians 4.26 says this. Be angry and do not sin. And do not let the sun go down your wrath. But it has to be the right type of anger. The implication is that, there, that it's not always wrong to be angry. But it's always wrong to be angry when you're angry in the wrong way. The Lord Jesus himself. Remember he got upset didn't he? He got angry when he overturned the money changers tables. But his was a righteous anger. He was angry at the right thing in the right way. And as believers, you know what we're supposed to be angry at? Sin. We're to be angry at what sin does in our lives, what sin does in the lives of people, how it wreaks havoc in our lives. And don't apologize for being angry at sin. But you have to be angry in the right way. It's a righteous anger we're talking about here. Aristotle once said this, Anyone can become angry. But to be angry with the right person to the right degree at the right time for the right purpose in the right way is not easy. It's not easy, is it? But we need to make sure that we're not sinful in our anger. And then he mentions the word wrath. And that's just taking anger to the next level there. It describes a sudden outburst of anger. All of a sudden, like, you know, you, you, know, like you have a little fire and someone takes a whole can of gasoline and throws it up there. And that, that just flames up. That's the image here. We might say, man, they really blew their top. They lost their temple. It's just that, that sudden outburst because of that anger that is smoldering in their life. And then they, that last button, button is pushed and they just kind of explode. And then he went to, mentions the word malice there. And that's kind of a broad word here. It's a Greek word for all sorts of moral depravity and, and, and sinfulness. And uh, it was a general term that described all sorts of evil. But used here, what it's speaking about is an eagerness to do harm to another person. It describes a malicious intent to injure someone or, or, or injure their character even. You know, when we gossip about people, we're hurting people. Talk about them. Oh, no, no, this is a prayer request. We as Christians have learned how to, how to cover up gossip and enable it a prayer request, and truly it's gossip. You say, how do you know? Oh, we know because the Spirit lets us know, friend. What's the intent behind it? We need to be careful at how we talk about people and how we, how we talk to people that we're not tearing them apart. Next, we're, you know, he talks about hypocrisy. He mentions the word blasphemy here. And this was a word that was associated with the word slandered. It's, it's whatever, you know, it, it was classified this way. When sinful speech was directed towards another person, it was considered slander. But when it was directed towards God and about God, that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. And then he uses the phrase filthy language. Another way we might say that is foul mouth. You ever heard someone say, that person is foul mouth. It speaks of and describes off-color uh, talking and objectionable speech and obscene speech. It carries the idea of any speech, any type of speech that's embarrassing to others and makes them ashamed, such as profanity and, and dirty jokes. Have you ever had somebody try to do this? They, they try to justify their language. Well, you know what, I, I, I just cuss, and, and it doesn't mean the same thing it means to you. Oh, really? What does the Bible say about our mouth? No filthy language, isn't that what it said? Well, it's not filthy in my, my way of saying that. What's it mean in our society? What's it mean in God's eyes? Friend, we can try to justify it all we want to, but when it comes down to God's definition of filthy language, we know what filthy language is, because God's word is clear on that. In other words, we need to be careful in how we talk. Our speech should always honor and glorify God. And we should put off, be done away with talking the way of the world like we used to before we knew Jesus. And then look at verse 9. He says, do not lie to one another. That word lie comes from the Greek word pseudo. It was described to an actor who was putting on a mask and playing the part of someone else. It speaks of a pretense. It speaks of a facade. Paul has just dealt with, with what we say. Now he deals with how we live. This is not just a matter of, of what we say with our lips, but this is what we say with our lives. How we live this out in our lives. 
Simply put, we're not to play the part of a hypocrite. We're not to pretend to be something that we're not. In other words, let me just put it this way. We behave one way on Sunday morning between 8.45 and 12 o'clock. And then the rest of the week, we behave a different way. Friend, that's the life of a hypocrite. That's, that's the life of a lie. Paul says, take the mask off. Be real with each other. Friend, that's what the Christian family is about, is, is sharing life together, being real with each other. I'm not saying that you can't come in here and say, you know what, I'm struggling with sin, because I want you to come in here so we can help you. I struggle with sin, and I have people that help me. But to come in here and say, I've got it. I've got no sin. And to say all the right Sunday school answers. And just to play the part and put our mask on. And we walk out those doors, we get in our car, and we live a different way the rest of six days of the week. Paul's saying we need to stop lying to one another. We need to be real with each other. We need to live out and talk about the change that Jesus has brought to our lives. And part of being real is coming to this place and being vulnerable with each other. This is being the family of God and saying, look, here's where I'm struggling. Here's where I'm, I'm questioning. I need help. Because we're all on our journey to get where God wants us to be. And we're at different places of that journey. And you may have someone who's not a believer that is questioning and, and trying to figure it out. Hey, they're welcome to come and learn right alongside of us. And you may have someone who's been a believer for decades. And they're further along the journey. But they're still learning. They're still growing. Friend, that's being real. That's being honest. All these matters which, which Paul mentions here, they're to have no part in, in a person's life that has been raised with Christ that he mentioned earlier. You see, the, the new man, the new woman, the new nature inside of us is supposed to rule and reign. Remember, we're to put to death the old nature. Be done away with that. Friend, if you want to be successful in God's eyes, you need to make sure you're putting off your old sinful ways. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about living a life of perfection. I'm not talking about living a sinless life because that's not going to happen on this side of eternity. I know there's been Christians that have said, I don't sin anymore. <laughs> they just did because they lied. We all still sin, but the problem that we have sometimes is we let sin control us instead of God doing a work in our lives and we have victory of that sin. We're all going to struggle with sin until we go home to glory, friend. But the question is who's in control? You or your sin? For if sin is in control of our lives right now, it's not right. If you're struggling with these sins, you don't have to. God wants to help you in the struggles you face. The Holy Spirit can come into your life. Come in your, he's in your life if you're a believer. But he can, he can change your desires when you let him have control of your life. You, as you study and you memorize God's word and you put God's word into your mind and into your heart. When these temptations come up, you know what the Holy Spirit does? He brings to mind that verse of Scripture that you're struggling with, with that sort of sin. One Scripture that I learned years ago, Job, I've made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon the young virgins. What's that mean? I'm not supposed to look at ladies in lust. You know, I mentioned at Community Revival that we joined a gym, we're going to a gym, and, and, you know, and I'm not trying to criticize ladies. They can dress how they want to. But you know, you have to be careful where you let your eyes go as a man in a gym. I'll be honest with you. You do. So what do you do? You know what I do? I look at the ground. And oftentimes I quote that verse, Job. I would let my, I've made a coat of my eyes not to look upon the young virgins. Why? So I don't lust. Our preacher struggles with lust. And you know what? You do too. But the key is the Holy Spirit's helped me to have victory over lust. So I don't sit there in the gym and lust after these women that are before my eyes. And it may, it may look rude. It may, look, uh, you know, it may not look right. I'm either looking at the TV. And, and look, I don't watch sports on TV. But you know what? I'll watch the golf channel if I have to. As opposed to look around the gym. Now I'll look around the gym because there's people there I know. There's people I talk to. People I've gotten to know and built a relationship with. But I'm not going to let my eyes, I'm not going to let my mind go down that path. And lead me further into sinning by lusting after those women. See, that's the power of God's word. You put that God, that's, that's a verse I memorized decades ago and it's still relevant in my life today. I memorized that as a teenager. I remember my youth pastor had made up these little cards and, and they had glasses on them. And that verse was printed in the glasses. And, 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 you know, things are different now. But he said, go home and set these on your TV. So when you had a temptation to look at something on TV, you shouldn't. There was that verse right above the TV. 
God's word works. What area are you struggling in? Find a verse and memorize it and put it into your heart, put it into your mind, so when that temptation comes knocking, the Holy Spirit brings that verse to mind. Do what Romans 12 talks about. Let the Holy Spirit renew your mind through God's Word. Change the way you think. But you've got to be in God's Word daily. And you know what? Ask a brother or sister to hold you accountable. Accountability, when it's done right and it's done biblically, it's very effective. But understand this, guys, you get a guy accountability partner. Girls, you get a girl accountability partner. That's how it needs to work. There's ways to help us have victory over this. Come and see Pastor Cameron. Come and see me. We'd be glad to do what we can to help you. Remember, it's off with the old as a Christian. We shouldn't be living this way anymore. Is that how we're living day in and day out? Now, here's a second idea I want to share with you. On with the new. Off with the old, on with the new. And don't worry, this point's not as long. I know you're thinking, he only got through one point. It's almost time to go to Sunday school. We'll get there, okay? Back during the days of the French Revolution, King Louis XVI and his queen, they were condemned to die. And they were beheaded there in the public square in Paris. And, and after they were executed, the crowd was in such a frenzy. You know what they did? They said, you know what? Bring the prince. Bring the king's son here. And he was only six years old, but he was next to become king. And the crowd wanted to eliminate him. And so this terrified little six-year-old boy, he comes to that platform there trembling. He, he had his black velvet coat on, his patent leather shoes. And the crowd began to scream, down with royalty, kill the prince. A six-year-old. And suddenly some of the crowd cried out and they said this. They said, don't kill him. You'll only send him to heaven and that's too good for royalty. Turn him over to an old wretch who will teach him filthy things. Then when he dies, his soul will go to hell. That's what royalty deserves. Now that's the love of your people, isn't it? You know, when they want that for your child. That's a sinful hatred right there. But according to that story, that's exactly what they did. The, the officials turned this young prince over to a filthy, sinful old woman by the name of Meg. And this vile woman began to teach him dirty ways and filthy words and dirty habits and a, and a sinful lifestyle. And every time that she would attempt to prompt him to do something that was sinful, he would stomp his feet and he would clench his fists and he would say this. I will not say things like that. I will not do things like that. I was born to be a king. I am a child of the king and I'm going to talk like it and act like it. Friend, if you're a Christian, you are a child of the king. And Paul makes the point that we ought to talk like it. We ought to think like it. We ought to act like it. We ought to live like it. And so we're exhorted to remove these things we've already talked about, to put off those corruptive things of a sinful nature. But now he exhorts us to put on characteristics of a godly lifestyle. That phrase, those phrases, put off and put on, they were used back in that time to describe initiation, and, initiation ceremonies into pagan religions. So, so the people, Paul's day, knew exactly what he was talking about. You see, the taking off one garment and the putting on of another was symbolic of, of having laid aside one's position with the gods and having assumed a new position with the gods. So this new clothing was symbolic of a new status. So the people that Paul was writing to that day, they got this idea of putting off the old way and putting on the new way. As Christians, we've received a new wardrobe, if you want to think about it that way. The moment that you were saved, the moment that you were raised with Christ, we are clothed in a brand new apparel. In verses 10 and 11, Paul reminds us from where these godly uh, characteristics come from. After we change our spiritual clothes, after we put off the, the old man, it says this. Look, it says, put on the new man who, receive, excuse me, who, re, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Whether the, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or un, nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. The old man... Is the old sinful nature. The new man is our new nature in Christ. That new nature is God's gift to us. And it comes with spiritual power through Jesus Christ. It opens a way for the, for the Christian to overcome and defeat sin. Not through our power, but through God's power. The idea is that, that once we put off the old nature, we put on this new nature. Off with the old, on with the new. And this new nature or, or the life in Christ. It, it takes us on this journey where more and more each day we're becoming conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ that Romans 8.29 says that God desires for us. Through this new nature, we become more Christ-like. 
You see, the old nature, he deals with, with the unregenerate men, man, man, uh, in, oh, unregenerate nature. That nature is defiled. That nature is deprived by sin or depraved by sin. But the new nature is a regenerate man. There's been change. It's what a believer in Christ is experiencing. As, as we've talked about, you know, you become that new creature, that new creation in Christ where all things become new. The new nature walks differently from the world. It loves God. It hates sin. It pursues the things of God. It pursues righteousness. The source of this new nature, the source of this new godly character is none other than, than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You see, those who have been saved by, grace, uh, by the grace of God are those who, whose old life has been put to death. We've died to that old way of life. And now we've been brought to life through Jesus Christ. We've been raised with Christ and we've been given this new nature. It's more than changing of spiritual apparel, though. It's changing of our entire life. Changing our thoughts, our actions, our desires, our behaviors. You see, the new life, the new life of the believer takes on a new course. It takes on new behavior. Look at verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. So these virtues that we're to put on now, he talks about here. You see, the old nature has moved out. The new nature is taking over. And we experience different things in our life. He says, put on tender mercies. This expression means to be, feel so deeply for another person that you experience what they experience. That when one suffers, we all suffer. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. Friend, this is truly caring for each other. And I'm so thankful that over the years I have seen you do this time and time again. That you have had tender mercies for each other. That when one of us is hurting, you come alongside and you love one, you care, and you hurt right along with them. And when one of us is rejoicing, you come alongside and you celebrate with them and you rejoice. Friend, that's what being the body of Christ is all about. That we are here for each other. That we are family. Then he talks about kindness. Often that's translated as goodness. But don't misunderstand this. This is not goodness by the world's definition. This is goodness by God's definition. Where do we find, our, find that in our society? Friend, our society needs the goodness of God. And we need to be sharing this with our society. I know it can be hard to be that way with some people. But remember, we have a new nature. And the Holy Spirit will empower us to show kindness to those who are mean to us. To show the goodness of God to those who hate us and talk about us and persecute us. But this is the way that God calls us to live. And then he mentions humility. And that's the idea of loneliness. It carried the idea of being willing to give up some of your own rights and your own privileges for the benefit of others. We're called as Christians to put others above ourselves. Man, that is contrary to the entitlement society we live in. It's all about me. I deserve this because of who I am. That's not the way of a Christian, friend. That's the way of the old nature. The way for the Christian is to put others above ourselves. Like who did? Jesus did. Jesus put others above himself. <coughs> and we are called to do the same. Just think how that would impact our community. And just think how that would impact our society. If that's how we lived our lives day in and day out. And then he mentions meekness. And that word was there used to speak of animals which had been tamed. It spoke of harnessed strength or strength under control and dedicated to the proper task. Think about this. As we live out meekness, we have the strength of God to do the will of God, to live the way that God has called us to live. And then long suffering, which you might translate or we might translate as patience. And this really spoke of patience with difficult people. Don't look. To your spouse. I'm not doing a bunch of marital counseling this afternoon. But we all have difficult people in our lives, don't we? You know who gives us the grace to deal with them? The Holy Spirit. Because when we deal with difficult people in our lives, people that just rub us the wrong way, people that push our buttons, people that just grate our nerves, and we show them the goodness of God, and we show them the love of God, you know what that shows? We really care about them. And we care about them so much, we're concerned about their future in eternity. Where are they going to spend eternity, in heaven or in hell? But if we're not patient with them, they just write us off and want nothing to do with us. And they'll never hear the message that God has called us to share. 
You see, these are just godly virtues that, that, that we're called to, to put into our lives. And we only do it through, through our new nature, through the Holy Spirit working our lives. And then in verse 13, Paul speaks about this very generous virtue here. He says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Now, these la two la lost virtues here, you know, we don't see a lot of times, especially in our society. And sometimes the sad reality is we don't see it in the Christian church today. But he's talking about bearing with one another and forgiving one another. That, that, that word for bearing basically means to, to put up with someone or willing to endure that person. Often it carried the idea of being tolerant with that person. And then the word forgiving, it's not just the act as, as if nothing happened. You don't just act as nothing happened. But the idea is, is you're restoring and you're redeeming this relationship in light of what has happened. That you're willing to forgive them. That restoration can come to your relationship and that relationship can be restored. You see, these two virtues are, are very closely linked together in, in, in what we're supposed to be living as Christians. That wardrobe we're supposed to be wearing. And bearing with one another... Think about it this way. We hold everything back. In other words, we, we bear with them. We endure them. Sometimes you want to say something and we don't say anything because we hold everything back. While forgiving one another, we hold nothing against them. In other words, you truly let go of what they did to you. You forgive them. And you don't, you don't hold that against them. However, in order for, for a person to be bearing with one another, it requires that we be forgiving to one another. In order for, for one to be able to hold nothing against someone, we must be willing and be able to hold everything back. They go hand in hand here. We must be willing to overlook things in their lives for the sake of what's better. Not saying we approve of it, not saying we condone it. But sometimes we just need to overlook certain things. Not sinful things, but those things that grate our nerves. Those things that get, they, where they push our buttons, that sort of thing. And if we're honest... We have to admit that, that one of the hardest tasks, not only in the Christian life, but in general life, this is one of the hardest things of, of bearing with one another and forgiving one another. It's, it's tough. Why? Because we're selfish and we want our rights. How can we do this? We're given a model. We're given an example to follow there. We're able to bear with one another. We're able to forgive one another. Look what it says. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. The model for Christian forbearance, the model for forgiveness is the way that Jesus has dealt with us. We stop and think about what that person does to us. We've done so much more to Jesus. When Jesus looks at us, he bears with us. He holds everything back. He doesn't give us what we deserve. And he holds nothing against us because we've been forgiven of our sins and we know him as our Lord and Savior. He overlooks it. He overlooks it in dealing with you and me. Heard about an employee one time that was called to the office of the president of the company. And he knew why he'd been called because he knew what he'd been doing. He'd been caught red-handed. He'd been, be had been embezzling money from the company for years. And so he knew he was going to be fired. He knew that he'd probably end up in prison. So he came to the president's office. The president sat down at his desk, looked across at this employee. And the man, you know, uh, was sitting there. And the president says, well, are you guilty of doing this? And the man he was broken by it. He was, he was convicted by it. He, he with great regret and great remorse, he said, yeah, I'm guilty of doing this. Well, the president was moved by what this man said. And he had sorrow for this man. So then he promised this man, this employee, he says, I'm not going to press charges against you. I'm not going to pursue any type of punishment whatsoever. So needless to say, the, the employee was just blown away. He couldn't realize. He was shocked. And the president asked him this. He says, if I take you back, can I trust you? The employee thought about it for a minute. He says, yes, I'm, I'm going to change. You can count on me. I'm going to trust you. And the employee, again, just couldn't understand why the boss was being so lenient towards him, why he's being so generous towards him. I mean, he deserved harsh punishment. He deserved to lose his job. He deserved to go to prison. But then the president leaned over his desk. He looked at the employee in the face and he said this. You're the second man who fell and was pardoned. I was the first. The mercy you have just received, I one day received myself. I forgive you because I too once was forgiven. You know, one of the saddest ways to go through life is to harbor resentment in your heart for someone else. We may think we're hurting them because we're bitter towards them, towards resentment towards them, but we're, you're hurting yourself. You're poisoning yourself. After everything that God and Christ has forgiven me of, I should be eager to forgive those who have hurt me, those who have offended me, those who have mistreated me. That's how we're called to live. 
That's the things we need to be putting on in our life. Friend, if you want to be successful in God's eyes, you have to dress for success based on God's definition of it. Off with the old, on with the new. So let me just ask you, Christian, if you know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, is this is how you're living your life day in and day out? Are you living this way day in and day out? Not just here on Sunday morning, but day in and day out. Friend, if not, you're not being successful in God's eyes. But it's not too late. God can help you overcome that. Why not return to that living today? When you do, friend, God will help you live that way. And God will be pleased with your life. And then one day, as you live that way, you live your life this way. Not saying you live a life of perfection. We already dealt with that. But this is your heart's desires. Live to be pleasing to God. When that day comes, and you're standing before King Jesus, and he looks at your life. Then he can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Friend, I don't know about you. Like I said, that's, that's what I desire. I want a life that is pleasing to Almighty God. But we can't just assume that's going to happen. We have to make a choice. We have to surrender to live that way each and every day. With God's help, we can do it. So maybe this morning, you just need to confess something. You need to get right with God. and You need to go back to living that way. Maybe you're living that way and, and you're doing better than ever. Praise God. And you just need to continue to rely on God's help to help you live that way. Maybe you're not living that way because you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You don't have that new nature. You, you just only have that sinful nature. So why not today ask Jesus to forgive your sins and turn away from them and place your faith and trust in Him. And receive that new nature today. And then you can have this relationship with Almighty God. Then you can, you can have that new nature we've been talking about. Live the way that we've been talking about. And you can have the assurance of heaven. And you can be pleasing to God as well. This is what God desires for us. The question is, are we living this way? Father, as we come to this time of decision, may we honestly evaluate our lives as I know your Holy Spirit's been speaking to our lives and our hearts through this time. But Lord, if there's anything that is displeasing to you, may you just point it out right now. And Father, that we change, we repent, and we get right with you this morning. And we begin to live the way that you call us to live. Father, for anyone who can't live that way because they only have the old sinful nature, may today be the day of salvation. Maybe right there in the pew or they come down here to the front, I'd be glad to talk with them about how to know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, and help them, Lord. Point them to you. But Father, I pray that we will leave this time this morning. We will be leaving, living a way that is pleasing in your eyes. So wherever that takes in this time of decision, May we respond with obedience because we love you. We ask this in your wonderful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. As we sing, you respond as the Holy Spirit has been leading you this morning.
Amen. Be seated for just a moment. Uh, i got a couple of folks I want to share with you. First, I'm going to call Zach and Lindsay up here. Of course, Lindsay came and uh, moved her membership back here from Gateway last week. And this morning, Zach comes to do the same thing. Amen. Amen. So we're excited to have Zach and, and uh, Lindsay with us. Zach does know Jesus. He's been baptized. And, and God's doing a great work in Zach's life. And so he wants to be obedient what God's called to do and be a member here at Red Mountain. So, so it's so good to have Lindsay and Zach with us officially. You've been here for coming for a while. Always been part of the family here. But uh, we are proud of you, Zach. And look forward to what God has in store for you in the days to come. And so I'm going to have them come back to the back of me in just a moment. And you come by and greet them. They're just going to stand here for just a moment. But I'm going to call Jeff and Donna Wrights up here as well. And certainly no strangers as, as well either. They've been coming for some time. God brought them down here from Pennsylvania and it's been a blessing to us. And they feel like it's time for them to join Red Mountain as well. So they're transferring their letter of membership for their church in Pennsylvania. So you welcome Jeff and Donna as well this morning. Amen. <laughs> of course, they know Jesus is the Lord and Savior, been baptized. And so we're excited what God's doing here and that just uh, how he's calling people to be a part of the family here. And look forward to what God has in store as we serve great, our great King Jesus together. So they're all going to join me in the back. And so you come by and you just welcome them officially to the family here at Red Mountain. Pastor Cameron, you come, share with someone else. So we're going to make our way to the back back there. All right, just uh, some quick announcements. Ladies, please come and join us for an uplifting time at our next women's Bible study on May 3rd at 6.45 p.m. And on Saturday, May 7th at 8 a.m., the Baptist men are heading up a work day at Life Choices of Roxboro. And we need your help with getting some projects done. So we will do some pressure washing, painting, install some light fixtures and other minor repairs. So men just plan on that for May 7th at 8 a.m. Our Baptist Men's Golf Tournament is going to be on May 21st, and so if you'd like to play, there's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center right over here, and you can sign up a whole team, or you can sign up as an individual, and we will place you on a team, and again, that's on May 21st. Uh, the nominating team has begun their work for the 2022-23 ministry year, and they do need your help, so if you haven't already, pick up a Serving Within the Body of Christ survey in the foyer or the Welcome Center, and you can take that home and pray about where the Lord would have you serve in this upcoming ministry year. And then once you've completed that survey, you can uh, return it to a member of the nominating team or to Pastor Dave. And uh, just finally, for all our youth and youth parents, there will be a meeting next Sunday, May 1st, right after the 11 a.m. service. Uh, please plan to attend this. We're going to have some vital information about upcoming events for our youth and a great new opportunity for our youth as well. So that's, again, that's next Sunday, May 1st, right after the 11 a.m. service for all youth and youth parents. Lord, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for uh, the day and just thank you for uh, just your word, Lord, and, and reminding us, God, reminding us who you are and who you are to us, Lord, and what we can accomplish through you, Lord. Uh, we just need to be mindful, God, that our sights and our, our hearts need to be set on you first and foremost every day. Thank you for those that have come this morning, Lord, to join our family. Uh, we're so thankful, Lord, they know you. Uh, they love you, Lord, and just uh, it's a blessing to us to have uh, more members joining the fellowship. So we're thankful for that. Be with us this week, Lord. Give us opportunities to serve you in new ways. And we pray all these things in your precious son's name. Amen.